Who has heard of software-defined storage? Well, I've mentioned it, so every hand should be up. Okay, so uh, who is using software-defined storage? All right, so this is a, a take on a couple of presentations I've done recently. So just so I can tailor the story to the audience, who is in a storage role where you currently are? Yeah? Who is in a DevOps role? Interesting. Who's in a sysadmin role? DBAs? Good, we don't like them. All right. Um, any other role that I didn't mention? Easy. All right. So today we're going to talk about why software-defined storage is critical to your IT strategy. Um, hopefully we've got time for a couple of questions at the end. Hopefully I'm informative and interesting enough that you've got some questions. Um, so the challenge that we're addressing is that, like everything else, there's pressure on storage because the applications that we're consuming are changing because the way in which our and, and your customers want to interact with you is changing, specifically in terms of the amount of uh, connectivity that they want to have with you. They want to do business in more places, in more time. Um, you know, an airline carrier, for example, is, is a global 24-7 organisation, but now so is a, a much smaller organisation. So with the proliferation of things like digital media, mobile, especially a lot of applications these days are mobile first, then there's cloud first. We're running our applications in more complicated or complex environments. We're running them in more locations simultaneously, so it's not just in our data center anymore. And we're creating more content than ever before. And so that creates a number of challenges and opportunities. So the key thing that I want people to understand is that when we talk about storage from a Red Hat perspective, we are not saying that the way in which we have done storage for the last 20 or 30 years is wrong. It's just that in a number of cases, the way in which we've been doing storage isn't necessarily appropriate for the ways in which we now consume that data or interact with applications, and that you're probably going to need both types. And I'll cover off a little bit of what I mean with that. So whether you're looking at uh, data analytics to get better insight into your business or your customers and, and how to perhaps take things to market, go uh, faster, you know, supply chain efficiency, or um, you know, open new markets, you know, faster development, or you know, drive efficiency in your uh, business. Or it might be a compliance or regulatory um, impact where you have to archive data for longer. Uh, who here loves tape? Right? So, well, you must work for IBM. Um, so, you know, typical response for a room this size, right? Like, tape is great, except it's slow, and we archive it, we send it to somewhere, right? So more and more these days that data needs to be online and it needs to be online longer. And so the way in which we've been doing storage makes that difficult and expensive. Then there's other areas. Now, you know, specifically we talk about web mobile or social or um, digital media and, and entertainment, but there's more and more content that is video or is images and, and videos, uh, um, pictures and sound, that's the word, audio. Um, than before in terms of how we interact with our customers. Or it might be things like CCTV or some other stream, you know, it might be Internet of Things. Same sort of uh, I.O. patterns. So the challenges that we're, we're having are that we're creating more data than ever before. We're keeping it longer and we need to access it in more locations and potentially with more uh, applications at the same time. So. Red Hat Storage looks at this and, you know, IDC estimates that around about 80% of an organization's data is what we call semi-structured or unstructured, as opposed to structured data. So structured data is, you know, your rows and tables like a, an Oracle or a SQL or DB2 database, like that sort of transactional, online transaction processing system. Unstructured and semi-structured might be machine-generated um, or stuff that you and I would interact with, you know, office documents, even things like backup, right? So, if 80% of your organization's data is, is unstructured, why would you put all of it onto a storage device that is specifically designed for structured data? You know, your fiber channel array does that really well and it solves that problem. It doesn't handle this, the, the large part of your, your storage requirements. And recent, until recently, we didn't really have any other option. So it's not that we've done the wrong thing, it's just that we didn't have any alternative. So in terms of where Red Hat helps, 
uh, is in that semi-structured and unstructured, unstructured space, specifically tied to making data closer and more integrated with your application. So if you think about uh, your fibre channel array, for example, you know, initially we had, let's say it was a, an ERP or a CRM or you know, some form of billing application, and it needed to be up. It needed to be fast, it needed consistent performance, and initially, you, know, you used to look out over your data center and you had all these servers with local disk. And you had, it wasn't that you had silos, you had islands everywhere. And that's very difficult to manage the performance or the capacity or the, the life cycle, the data management aspects of that. And so storage vendor comes to you and says, hey, we've got this great box. You go through this cycle, you go, yep, that's great, you buy it. And it does what the vendor said it would do. And now, you've got this great environment, you know, your, your application, it, it, it gets all the benefits that you were sold, that you needed, and you're happy. And the vendor comes back and says, well, Mr. Customer, you know, how's it going? You go, yeah, yeah, it's great, and everything you said is true. And okay, well, I see across your data center, you've got all these other little bits of data. Why don't we go and take them and put them onto this U-Butte array that you've bought? You know, and you go, well, what they told me the first time was true, I've had a good experience, so I've got no reason to doubt it. So you go and collect all this other data and you put it onto this array. And now you've got this big silo. And for a while, it works. The challenge is that if you look at the way in which we are creating data, that 80% that is semi-structured or unstructured is growing at approximately 24% compounded a year. Whereas your structured data, especially in terms of uh, like uh, array sales is going backwards by 2%. So if you look at your structured, you know, your Oracle database or your SQL database or, or those style of systems, they might be growing by a couple of terabytes a year. Whereas, you know, your backup or your application data, your archives, your digital media, your big data analytics, that's the area that's growing. So if you think about the cost and the amount of money that you spend on this great array, and the limitations that it provides or, or restricts you with, that it's this big and it costs that much, that it's not really a sustainable model. Added to the fact that who here is doing something in a public cloud? Really, this, you're the only room where there's two people. So is, is no one else doing anything in public cloud? Okay, right, that, we'll, we'll tell marketing not to do the cloud thing anymore. Um, so for those four of you, who are doing public cloud, um, can you go and take your fibre channel array and put it in Amazon? No, right? Because it's hardware and cloud is software. So when you start looking at those sort of problems around data mobility or application accessibility, um, that's a problem. Then you start looking at, well, if my structured data is you know, roughly staying stagnant, but my unstructured is growing at you know, 20, 24%, and that's 80% of my workload, but this device is really suited to you know, this other you know, style of application, that's a bit incongruent. And then we start looking at, well, if I've got these applications that I need to scale out, I've got many instances of them. So let's say it's digital media or it's backup or it's data analytics or it's internet of things, and I've got, or, or I'm running a private cloud, like say OpenStack and I've got all of these compute nodes doing stuff, and then I'm trying to channel them all into you know, this tiny little island to access the storage, I've now also got a performance bottleneck. So if we could scale out not just the capacity but the performance, that immediately give, provides benefit to the application. So when we think about how we size our traditional arrays, we go, okay, so I've got that much data, and I think that my rate of change is roughly you know, whatever percentage, and I need to write this device off over three or five years, so I need a box that's that big. And typically, halfway through whatever that term is, you've filled it, because you're growing it at least 20% for 80% of your data. And then you need to go back to your CFO or your financial controller and you know, beg for more capital. And they, they go to you, well, how could you get this so wrong? And it's not your fault. You know, applications are driving this change, not the underlying storage. So all of a sudden you've now got this problem where what you thought would last you three or five years now lasted you half of that, and then, okay, so I go and buy another one. Do I buy one that's 
the same size and I, I load balance them or do I buy one that's just enough for what I need or do I buy one that's enough for what I need and I do a forklift migration, now I've got this massive impact to my applications. So there's all these other problems around how we manage data. But if we could think big and start small and then scale as we need in the, in the, the growth rates that we need as we need them, that's much more manageable. So that's what Red Hat does, like really in a nutshell. But we do it in software. So, covered that. So talking to a, a number of customers that the, it's interesting that our storage vice president, Ranga, uh, Ranga Chari, had a conversation with a, a, a vice president of applications at a US bank. And he said, you know, in a word, uh, how would you describe your environment? And you know, he cheated and said two words, but it was storage anxiety. That we've had this uh, journey for the last five or so years around significant change in our data centers and our application environments. And storage is kind of one of those last areas to fall. And I kind of think that the reason for that is that we spend so much capital on these systems and their big boxes of tin that it's not the easiest thing to change. Like even networks have gone software before storage has in, in network function virtualization and software defined networking. So if we think about you know, compute virtualization, whether it's something like legacy VMware or Red Hat virtualization, private cloud or public cloud, we understand that it's very simple to go and deploy a new compute workload. I can go and deploy a Linux server or a Windows server. I can you know, run it locally. I can run it you know, remotely. But typically, and especially if it's on-premise, if I need storage, I need to go into this request wait state. And I'm waiting for someone. And it's very industrial age, you know, like the, the Henry Ford you know, uh, factory line. And so I need to go and allocate that storage. I need to go and, you know, who here from the storage group still uses spreadsheets to manage your arrays? Right? And do you also have the vendor tools to manage the array as well? Right? So that's fairly typical because managing storage is, as much as it seems simple, you have lots of differing demands from your applications, what we call sociability or like the noisy neighbor. So it's quite complex in terms of balancing that. And then, you know, which channel is it on? Which fabric is it on? And then there's the, the people process of, you know, someone has to go and do something and then give it back to whatever the requesting team is. So more and more customers are looking at how can we get greater efficiency out of this just from a productivity point of view, let alone being more agile or having more uh, cost effectiveness. So it's interesting, I, I did a tour recently and, and halfway through this quote came out, you know, the former CTO of EMC, basically saying that Amazon has destroyed his business and it will never be the same again. Um, whether that's strictly true or not, I don't know, but the, the point is, is still valid in that software is changing the way in which we do things and largely it's driven by the consumerization <coughs> of everything. You know, it's mobile first, I want it now, I want it at you know, 3 a.m., et cetera. So, the way in which we have done IT, and, and in this case, the way in which we've done storage, is not going to go back to the way that we're used to. So who's seen this sort of journey slide before? Oh, good, I'll tell the whole story. All right, so from a development point of view, you know, we've gone through this process where you know, we had one you know, waterfall, which I always laugh at. It was an academic paper of how not to do software development. So everyone went, that's how we should do software development. Then we did Agile. Who, who remembers extreme programming? Right? So, you know, we've had lots of changes. Now we're in this DevOps state. And, you know, I find it interesting that DevOps is not just around the software development process or the, the application lifecycle. It's across your entire IT stack. And it's not just, you know, about tooling and technology. It's about people and process as well. And so, you know, you can have all the U-Boot tools that you want, but unless you adopt the methodologies and the, importantly the thinking, it doesn't really matter what tool you use. And you know, we've seen that throughout you know, history, not just in IT. So there's been a lot of change in that space. And a lot of it is about being faster or failing fast, being good enough and then fixing it rather than this big bang approach. Then we did it around the application architectures. You know, there's been a lot of change like you know, the mainframe and the terminal, then we had client server, now we've got microservices. Um, you know, we had ESBs and buses and things like that. You know, different ways to present the data to the user and how the business logic and the data was stored. Then we were looking at different ways in which we did the packaging. You know, 
basically, the, the long and the short of this is every stage across the IT lifecycle has been changing, and storage is no different. And it's interesting that most of these changes have been driven by open source. You know, if you look at big data, you look at cloud, you look at software-defined data centers in, in storage or in uh, networking, in compute, all of the innovation in that space is in the open source community. It used to be that open source commoditized what the proprietary companies did. Now it's pro proprietary companies are playing catch up. So if it weren't for things like Linux or Hadoop or uh, KVM or Gluster and Ceph and you know, all these other open source projects that you know, in many cases Red Hat productizes and makes enterprise ready, we wouldn't have a lot of the world we have today. So it's interesting that you, know, you talk to customers and a lot of them now are in a position where they're talking about uh, it has to be open source first and there's got to be a reason to go proprietary. So things are changing. And again, storage is no different in this respect. So if we think about the way in which we used to buy storage was in an array. And we had some box, you know, or it might be multiple boxes in this device, and all the storage was inside it. And in terms of how you know, all this stuff is measured, there is now more storage that is purchased outside or externally than internally. So, you know, inner server or SaaS attached, things like that. And so the reason that that's happening is because our application architectures are changing and we're deploying a lot of software-defined storage to take advantage of that. And if you look at the, yeah. And then if you look at where software-defined storage is, is growing, you know, file and object are the ones that are growing the fastest, not really block. So block is still important, but more and more applications are adopting object. Now, object has got a number of advantages because it means that if I know the content that I'm after, I can just request that via some form of you know, URI or, or address. I don't really care where it lives. I just have some you know, RESTful interface and just get it for me. I don't really care you know, it's on this directory or it's on that disk, and I've got metadata that describes it so it's contextual. And then from a file perspective, you know, we're getting more and more applications require file and less so block. And from a cloud perspective, file is much easier to consume than, than block is. You know, block doesn't move, files can. So in terms of what you, know, you as a customer would be doing, that we're not saying to get rid of your existing arrays. However, if we think about, you know, there's all this data that you've got, and if 80% of it is unstructured or semi-structured, you know, I kind of think of it in terms of, it's like buying first-class airfares for your in-laws. You don't really want to, but sometimes you have to, right? And if that's the only thing that you have, then that's where you put your content. But now that we know that we've got options and that we've got flexibility and perhaps better ways in, in which we can do things, as we go on that journey and you know, we remove you know, potentially unsuitable data from our fiber channel arrays and put them on some form of software-defined scale-out system, I've still got that device. So I can take those existing spindles and repurpose them. I can apply them to my database and make it go faster. Who here has applications that you'd rather run slower? The laugh could be bigger. Like who, who, right? So if we can throw more disks at a database, you know, it's going to run faster. Or potentially I can have more snapshots so that my developers can have more flexible you know, development environments. Because I've still got that device and I want to make use of it. But then when I refresh that piece of hardware, potentially I could get a smaller one. So it's important to realize like the total cost of ownership of a fiber channel array is not just the array. You know, often a vendor will say, well, we'll sell you this big box and then we'll you know, only sell you certain shelves and at storage on demand. But you've still got this whopping great big chassis sitting in your facility that you're paying rack space for or you're paying power and cooling. Um, you can't put something else there. And then you've got fiber channel port licenses. You've got fiber channel SFPs or fiber SFPs. You've got um, multi-pathing software licensing depending on the vendor, all these other tools. Um, so there's all these flow-on cost savings of having a tool that is fit for purpose and then having you know, your unstructured and semi-structured data live in that scale-out software-defined environment. So does that kind of make sense? So you get a saving now and a saving later. So if you think about the appliance, it's, it's only ever so big, right? It doesn't get any bigger. If I have many little devices that act as one, 
that's very different. I've got a lot more flexibility. And so that's what we're talking about. So in terms of how does this all kind of work and, and hang together, from a Red Hat perspective, that it, you know, we're a software company. We've got lots of hardware partners. And what we typically find is that customers will take that first step and, and you know, look, I'll try your thing, right? We'll give it a go. And they love it. They, they like that it, it's lower cost up front. They like that the total cost of ownership is lower. They like the functionality. They like the fact that they don't need to continually add more storage administrators as their storage environment gets bigger because it's easier to manage because everything's software, I can orchestrate it and automate it. But then I can also run it on commodity hardware. So today you might like Dell. You know, next door we've got Andrew Underwood talking from Dell. You know, we've got a lot of Ceph and Gluster customers running on their hardware in, in this area. You know, other vendors as well, but you know, timely. Um, but then they might go, well, yeah, look, Dell's good. But then they work out that if, if all of the, the smarts are in software, why do I need to pay top dollar for tier one hardware where it's not actually adding anything? Like if, if the hardware just needs to be good enough, perhaps I can run on you know, a Quanta or a Supermicro. So you then take that next step and I've got you know, further cost savings and flexibility. So rather than having you know, these traditional silos where it, you know, a hardware and software package locked together that you've got no flexibility, even to the point where you, you, know, you can't take the drive out and use it somewhere else because it's, it's firmware locked, we now have this idea of a software layer that provides this interface and this pool of content or this you know, storage that is made up of lots of discrete components. Now, initially, we saw you know, in first generation software-defined clusters, every single server chassis was the same type. Now, it might be 12 bay, 36 bay, 60 bay, but everything was the same. What we're seeing now is customers go, well, actually, I've got different application requirements, thus different storage requirements. So you know, when we look at the ways in which we do performance and sizing guides for software-defined storage, we've kind of got three types of workloads. There's throughput optimized, there's IOPS optimized, and there's capacity optimized. And so you know, we've got reference architectures in which, you know, for different hardware vendors, then you can use that as a building block that's modular and then customize as much or as little as you want for your particular environment. So the storage really does meet your application requirements. So you might say that, look, I'm doing some private cloud stuff, so I need some throughput, and I'm also doing some backup, so I want capacity. And you could treat that as one storage service, manage and orchestrate it the same, grow it as you need, and it's tailored to you, and I've got different styles of servers in there. So does, does that flexibility make sense? Would, would that add a bit of value rather than you know, monolithic blocks that are inflexible? The interactive bit. Yep, cool. All right, so we have two storage products. We've got Gluster, which is an enterprise distributed file system. It does NFS 3 and 4, does SIFS with SMB 2 and 3, and it's got a unified um, Swift object interface that suits a particular use case. So if you're thinking, I need file services or I'm doing anything with containers, Gluster. Or if I want to have a storage system that is portable and agnostic to the underlying infrastructure, then I can run on bare metal, I can run in a, a virtual environment, I can run in a, I can containerize, run as a container, or I want to run in a private cloud or in a public cloud, Gluster can do that. Pretty much anywhere that Red Hat Enterprise Linux can run, Gluster can run. So when you start thinking about your journey from where you are today to a public cloud, now customers are also thinking about, well, maybe I don't just want to buy a mainframe you know, in someone else's data center and be locked into one public cloud vendor. I want lots of options, and I might choose Azure, Amazon, Rackspace, Google, you know, Telstra, and I want flexibility, whether it's from technical or commercial <coughs> aspects, that I can now deploy Gluster and an application. I can deploy Gluster and say OpenShift for container management, and then I can deploy the JBoss XPAS suite on top and, and Red Hat Mobile, and I can have this fully software-defined stack from software-defined networking and storage all the way up to the presentation layer, and it's completely agnostic to the infrastructure that runs below it. So it means that if for whatever reason that my, store, my um, server vendor on-premise changes, who cares? If I decide that this particular uh, public cloud vendor is no longer suitable or doesn't meet SLAs or there's an outage because you know, it happens, then all of those deployments are the same 
in terms of the architecture. So I don't have to worry about complexity or changes. Then we've got Ceph. And Ceph underlying is an object store that serves block primarily for OpenStack, but you can connect it just to a rel system, and object for S3 and for Swift. So why would you bother about this? I suppose the, the most important thing is that it's about flexibility and choice. But backing that up, being able to divorce yourself from being locked in and having freedom and flexibility to choose the deployment mechanism and the deployment uh, size and, and the way in which you, you know, build and consume your storage gives you a lot more power and flexibility and it allows you to meet these increasing and changing demands of the applications. Because storage is nice, right? Like I run the storage business for ANZ, but in the end, we serve data to apps. It's the apps that matter. That's the line of business. That's how we interact with our customers. That's how we you know, sell services to you know, our users or our, our customers. So storage is nice, but it's a reason to deploy something. It's not the end result. So rather than having this scale-up architecture where it's only ever so big, I can now think big, start small, and scale as I need. And then you know, I can divorce myself from hardware. I don't need to have tier one hardware. It used to be in the traditional data center that would have you know, clustering. And now, regardless of the vendor, whether it's us or anyone else, clustering is a pain in the butt. It's awful. It's complicated. It's prone to misconfiguration. It never works the way you want. And so if we could get away from those highly engineered systems that are designed to handle failure as a, an exception and have a system that expects failure is a common state and just work around it, and not worry about, oh, something's broken. It's just another thing is broken. We just, we just expect that and not have to bat an eyelid and things just continue. It gives you a lot more flexibility and consistency in your applications. And then from a, a development process, you know, as we covered, all of this innovation is happening in the open source environment. It's now the proprietary vendors, and this is the same in storage, that are playing catch up. You know, you know, there's a number of vendors that are trying to reinvent themselves. There's a number of vendors that are really feeling the pinch. Um, but in terms of the, uh, where new developments are happening, it's all in the, you know, the open source environment. So in a nutshell, storage is changing, just like everything else. And what Red Hat does is we make storage act like modern infrastructure, or infrastructure as code for those that you know, are in that DevOps space. So from uh, where you would see us fit, is in a particular set of use cases, you know, we're not going to go and do your Oracle database. That problem's been solved. But that's not the problem that you've got today. It's in that unstructured and semi-structured space where all of that growth is happening. So if you're looking at, you know, it used to be backup and archive was boring. And if something went wrong, that's when it was exciting. And you never wanted exciting backup. Right? You wanted it to be boring. But now we've got increased compliance and regulatory uh, impacts, especially as we have more data in more locations. You know, there's sovereignty issues. You know, there's data analytics that is a very uh, emerging and booming uh, adoption curve for customers that wanting to get better insights into their data and make better decisions for their organizations. That's, that's the area that we're good for. Or if you're doing containers, you know, anything in the Docker or the rocket space, you know, the whole point of that is to make life easier and to get people out of the way. And traditional storage puts people back in the path of productivity. So that's where software-defined storage that is integrated with those sort of systems enables the actual realization of that promise. So who does this in Australia? You know, it, it's not just me talking from stage saying it's great. You know, we've got people in the research space, universities, we've got telecommunications customers, you know, we've got media and entertainment, we've got government, uh, who else is there? Cloud providers. You know, financial institutions. Um, for those of you who have seen you know, some news in the last couple of months, Melbourne Uni has got what they suspect is the largest CEPH deployment in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, certainly our largest in Australia. It's currently five petabytes and they're growing that. Um, and that's all on Dell servers and Mellanox networking. So it's not the traditional way in which you did storage. And they're very upfront and say that they save around about 75% from doing you know, traditional scale-up storage. Then you've got Melbourne Uni that's doing Gluster for Archive, right? Now, they're using Ceph as well, but they're particularly proud about the advantages that they've got here. So the next question is, 
how do, I, how do I get my hands on this and play with it? So we do have these things called test drives. And this is where we have built a number of environments that you can just go and use. So there are short links there, um, but if you Google Red Hat test drive, you know, the registration page comes up. There's no charge for that. You, know, you get a, a, a workbook-driven lab environment where you can go and do some exercises and try so, some stuff out. And then if you're interested, you know, the way in which we approach this is very much from a, a discovery and a consultative phase. So if you want more information, typically what we say is, OK, like, where is it you're having a problem? And let's work out you know, those stakeholders and look at the challenges that you're having. It is very important for us that you understand that we're not advocating to get rid of your existing storage because we don't do everything it does. But it can't do the challenges that you're having today, and that's where we solve those problems. So, thank you. Thank you.